Hello, I'm Dan Gibson, and this is another video in the series Questions and Answers. This week's question is about hadiths. Are they trustworthy? Or are they even useful? And why do I use them in my research? These questions address a very complicated area of study, and whole books and careers have been based on the hadiths. So let me emphasize at the beginning that I am not a scholar of Hadith studies. But in order to give an answer, I don't think I have to be. I think it is all about perspective. First, a little bit of background. Modern Western analysis of Hadith go back to a Hungarian scholar, uh, Mr. Goldziher, back uh, in the 1889. He was a skeptic and he questioned the origins and the nature of Hadith. And that set into tone for Western scholars ever since this whole idea of skepticism. Since most of the Hadiths were written in the third century of Islam, Goldziher questioned the, the validity of the connection of Hadiths with the age of the Prophet. Goldziher was followed by Joseph Sachet uh, in the 1950s, who wrote Origins of Mohammedan uh, ju uh, Jurisprudence. And uh, he endorsed uh, the skepticism that uh, Goldziher had expressed. And uh, it was all about the historical link between the Hadiths and the, the Prophets, or even the time of the Prophets. The most significant achievement of uh, Sachet's work was when he made it clear that the link had not even been claimed uh, as uh, any sort of consistent or systematic way uh, up until the time of the uh, scholar Shafi, who was second century Islam. Now this brings up an important uh, subject. As a historian, I am more interested in the order that things took place than in the religious significance of the things themselves. I will try to explain this as I go along. Perhaps we need to start with a timeline. I trace the development of the Hadiths that went through uh, this timeline rather than just talking about hadiths in general. So timeline, I am going to uh, use Hijri dates. So 132 after the Hijra, the Abbasid rule begins. In 144 after the Hijra, Ibn Ishaq writes Sir to Rasulullah. And notice the writing of history comes before the writing of hadiths. This is very fundamental and important. I will repeat it. Notice the writing of histories began before the writing of hadiths. Because we will ask the question, what came first, the writing of history or the writing of hadiths? And the writing of history came first. And collecting and writing of hadiths was a second phenomena based on the first. In uh, 148 after the Hijra, uh, al-Sadiq comes along. He's the sixth Imam of Shia. He starts his own school of law with around 4,000 students. He's seen as the father of Sharia law by some, but he dies in 702, possibly poisoned. Some say he, because he introduced the concept of Sharia law, uh, which the Caliphs at the time were opposed to. This is a pivotal time in history, as al-Sadiq taught Abu Hanafa, who began the Hanafi school of law, and he also taught Malik uh, ibn Anas, who was the founder of the Maliki school of law. Malik ibn Anas taught uh, as Shafi, who started his own school of law. But uh, Shafi was a teacher of Ahmad ibn Hanbal of the Hanbali school of law. So all four schools of Islamic law originated from uh, Jafar al-Sadiq. The reason for this is that before Jafar al-Sadiq's time, the leaders of Islam judged cases themselves or their governors judged these cases. There was not any systematic method of deciding cases. In pre-Hadith times, the rulers simply gave answers the best they could. During most of the Umayyad period, the administration of justice lay in the hands of the provincial governors, and so uh, insofar as special judges were appointed, which, who were merely agents of the governors. Um, different officials acting in different centers dealt differently with similar questions. In some instances, answers were given without reference to the Quran or to the common practice of the other governors. 
Here's an example. Abdullah, son of Abu Huraya, asked the son of Umar whether fish that had been washed ashore by the sea could be eaten. He replied with a firm negative. But shortly afterwards, he asked for a Quran to be brought to him. And there he found a passage from which he was forced to conclude that he had given the wrong answer to Abu Huraya. That is an example of how the leaders arrived at their conclusions. There's another story. Abu Sa'ad uh, reports, I was sitting with a group of Ansar when Abdullah came, looking very frightened. And he said, I asked to be allowed to be seen Umar three times, but I was not allowed to go in, so I went away. Later, Umar asked me why I did not wait. And I said I had asked three times to be allowed to see him, and each time I was denied admission, so I went away. Since the Prophet said once, if you ask permission three times to enter and are not permitted to do so, go away. Umar rather strenuously insisted that I bring him confirmation of what I reported. Did any of you by chance hear the Prophet say this th very thing? Um, Ubay ibn Kab uh, said in response to Abdullah's pleas, By God, only the youngest will accompany you. Abu Sa'ad said, Being the youngest pr present, I got up and went with them and informed Umar that the Prophet had indeed said that. So at this time, the hadiths had not been gathered. So the rulers and the governors were attempting to make decisions that, uh, and they were very conscious of wanting to make the correct decision according to what Muhammad would have said or done. The whole basis of hadith was this desire to emulate or to act similar to the Prophet Muhammad. That desire goes far beyond just trying to please what Muhammad would have wanted. It involved imitating the smallest details that Muhammad had done. Everything he said, everything that he had uh, done, it all had authority. This goes far beyond how the Catholic Church and Christianity deals with the Pope speaking ex cathedra or speaking as a representative of God himself. In this case, in, in the case of Muhammad, everything he did was important. Which way did he face when he was urinating was an important topic. No one was trying to emulate a Catholic Pope like that. Every Christian wasn't concerned about little details about following Jesus. But Muslims were doing everything they could to copy every aspect of their prophet's life. So when Ibn Ishaq came along and wrote down the first biography of the prophet, this fascinated everyone because now a well-researched story was finally established. Then came Jafar al-Sadiq and he started to systematize the stories to be used on a legal basis or a religious basis. Up until this time, it is impossible to speak of a uniform sunnah in Islam. But Jafar al-Siddiq laid the basis for what would later become Sharia law by formalizing accounts of what the Prophet said and did. He was not appreciated, and he was jailed, and later it believes he was poisoned. But one of his students, Al Shafi, built on the foundation of Jafar al Sadiq and Al Shafi's, is uh, credited with creating the science of fiqh, or understanding the deep things of Islamic law. And so some of the legal schools were formed before the hadiths that we know of today were written down. Did you catch that? Look at the order below as we go through the timeline. These schools of law were formed before Bukhari and others published their Hadith collections. Some of it was happening at the very same time as the research was happening in the Hadiths. Once a history had been written, then there was a sudden interest in collecting Hadith. So 150 after the Hijrah 
Hanafi school opened. 179 after the Hijra, Maliki school opens. After that, in 187, Al-Waqidi writes his history. In 205, Al-Shafi school is founded. In 218, uh, Ibn Hisham writes uh, his edited history of Ibn Ishaq. In 241, Al-Hanbali school is founded. So far, the great Hadith collections have not yet been published. It's not until 255 after the Hijra, almost 100 years after Hanafi's school of law was started, that Bukhari publishes his collection. 255 A.H. Uh, uh, Bukhari publishes a Hadith. 261 Al-Muslim publishes a Hadith. 275 Abu Dawood, who worked, said he worked on it for more than 10 years, writes his Hadith. 279 after the Hijra, Tirmidhi publishes his Hadith. And not until a hundred years after Al-Shafi school was founded did Al-Tabri publish his work. In 308 after the Hijra, Al-Tabri writes the history down. But at that time, uh, he opens his own school of uh, jurisprudence with an emphasis on understanding early Arabic language. Remember that the uh, Islamic religion and doctrine at this time has already been established. So Al-Tabri wasn't going to rock the boat as it were. He's writing with a view to support the status quo. So we have a development. Islam didn't begin with Hadith. Um, if I can say this, the development of Islam ended with Hadith. Once Hadith were established, there was no room to add or question or change anything in Islam. So here is the development. First, the early rulers of uh, the and governors relied on people's memories of what uh, Muhammad had said. These were then remembered, taught, and used by others. It was all an oral setting. But they were struggling as far as, because the far reaches of the Muslim world was, was pushing farther and farther, and as time marched on, there were fewer and fewer people whose memories reached back to Muhammad. Once the Abbasids took control, the first histories were then written down. Then the schools of law were developed using oral memories of people, not written. Finally, the hadiths uh, were started to be collected and the oral hadiths were written down for people to uh, have records. These hadith writers were influenced by what already existed in these schools of law. Some of these hadiths were used by specific schools of thought against others. Some hadiths were massaged and expanded so that they could address rival political theology and legal uh, programs and things going on. Eventually, the main method of trying to determine the authenticity of a specific hadith was to examine the isnad, or the, the list of names attached to the hadith. But even this was problematic because some of the conflicting hadiths are uh, ascribed to the same people. Uh, and in some cases, the hadiths became weapons of debate, wielded on one side or wielded on the other. This is what caused Gul Zihr and others to follow him to become very skeptical of hadiths. So were the hadith writers writing history or only hadiths? Did they see themselves as writing religious texts or simply writing historical histories uh, and the legal people were then latching on and using them? I think the question, uh, it's quite plain to this question, that the legal schools were based on all hadith and traditions and the writing of hadith and the collecting of them was done to serve the schools of law. Notice uh, the difference between history, histories and hadiths. The difference is mostly how the material is organized. The histories used isnad as well as the hadiths. So the difference is now on how the writers organize things. Histories are arranged in chronological order, while hadiths are arranged uh, by subject or for category. When you go to the hadiths, you have no sense of chronology. No attempt is being made to uh, place things in any sort of chronological order.
Rather, hadiths are arranged according to legal topics. In both cases, they are looking back, back to Muhammad, back to the companions of the Prophet. But in, in fact, it seems to me that in practice, much of the daily life of Muslims is based more on hadith than on Quranic texts. The main reason why hadiths were sought after was so that people could imitate the Prophet. This was the, the most outward actions that the Prophet had done. For, for example, after Muhammad died, there was a great deal of discussion about how to wash after rising from sleep. A great deal of discussion took place about halal foods and also about fasting and because fasting could be negated by what goes into the body so lots of discussion even to this day. In the end uh, Muhammad's life was examined in great detail so the Muslims knew how they too should live. But people remembered events differently. There were conflicting accounts of what Muhammad had said or done. It's my opinion that if one takes the hadiths as a method of examining history, then we can learn a great deal about early Islamic community and the issues they face. But if one is taking hadith only as religious text for personal guidance, then problems arise. My interest in hadith is in history, not theology. I already accept that the early Muslims struggled to define what their religion was all about. Once Muhammad had died, the community was left in turmoil, and the Quran uh, was, uh, was remembered orally, it wasn't even written down. Quranic texts uh, were even in question at the time, as people tried to remember different things the Prophet had said and what was revealed to him, and different attempts were made to collect all of these re revealed things into one united book called the Quran. So for a time everything was in flux. Now as long as the companions of the Prophet were alive, people could revert to them and count on their memories. But when Hajjaj came along, he made some radical changes to Islam that the companions of the Prophet resisted and Hajjaj killed most of them. And what is surprising is that no one attempted to gather or write down what these companions were saying for another hundred years. The writing down of the Hadith seemed to be a great challenge, perhaps because uh, there was a conflict between what the people remembered and what was being said in the second and third century. So during this time, many internal wars took place in the first and second centuries of Islam, and hadiths were often quoted to support one side or another. During the second century of Islam, one side called themselves the family of the Sunnah uh, and unity, and the other side called themselves Ahl al-Bayt, or the family of the house of the Prophet. Both sides made use of hadiths to support themselves. Eventually, we uh, would know these two sides as Sunni and the other as Shia. But during this time, a new precedent was set when Umar decided to, ch to change decisions set by Abu Bakr. Actually, he decided not to change them. This soon developed into a systematic view of legal decision based on past precedent. So eventually decisions made by Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman made their way into Hadith collections as well. But this was not extended on to Muawiyah and others who followed him, just in the first four caliphs. So over time, important distinctions were made. The Hadith was the story, or the document itself. The Sunnah was the practice, or the ruling that came out of the story. But soon, there was varied Sunnahs for each of the Hadith stories. On top of this, the practice of listing the, the Isnad, or the chain of narrators, was not really known in the first century of Islam. As long as people were still alive who remembered what the Prophet had said, or remembered what a companion of the Prophet had said, or who lived under the guidance of one of these uh, caliphs, the first four caliphs, no one felt they needed this chain of narrators.
But in the uh, centuries that followed, whenever people bickered about what was uh, the prophet said or did, they started saying who had told them this and where that person had gotten his information and where that person had gotten his information. This chain of, of communicators is called Isnad. And some of the people named in the chain of communicators were uh, considered more important to them and trustworthy than others. The oldest surviving law book comes from Malik, who was a student of Ibn Ishaq. Malik leaves us with a total of 1,720 hadiths. Of these, 600 were traced back to the Prophet himself. 222 had incomplete isnad. Uh, 613 go to the companions of the Prophet, 285 were views of later scholars, and 61 had no isnad at all. Malik died in 179, and he left us with the earliest book of Hadith. After Malik, others started collecting Hadith, and the whole science of Hadith was soon developed. What I find interesting here is that the Hadiths were born out of the histories. Ibn Hisak writes the biography of the Prophet so that people could have the stories. But soon as these writings were copied and circulated, certain people started to use those histories as Hadiths. This is an important point. What started out as history was soon grabbed by the religious and legal leaders and used in their arguments with each other. So collections of hadith started popping up at the beginning of the third century of Islam. Not histories. These hadiths become the foundation of emerging schools of Islamic law. They become a source of contention, as some of the hadiths disagree with others. In some sense, the Muslim community lost their ability to think chronologically because they're thinking hadiths, not history. And the interpretation of hadiths uh, was given by local teachers and it became more important to individual Muslims than any personal understanding or con uh, conclusion reached by individuals themselves. That's a change I see in Islamic history over time. Until even now, people want to know what teacher told you that, not did you work it out for yourself. Now, in their quest for identifying authentic hadiths from those who had changed or developed, uh, these hadith experts established rules by which they could examine hadiths and classify them. In this way, Bukhari and others could eliminate vast majority of hadiths that they heard from uh, other people. One of the examples I have used in the past are hadiths dealing with Noah's Ark, circulating the Ark before it ended up on the mountain. This was rejected by many hadith experts, yet when I examine the hadiths, I find that this hadith was among the earliest hadiths, not attributed to the Prophet, but to the companions of the Prophet, most of the time to Ibn Abbas. Uh, you find that in Azraki. For me, uh, this hadith seems to have originated in the preaching of Ibn Abbas and thus uh, made its way into some hadith collections. By the third century, it was considered weak, not acceptable. And much the same way, there were hadiths about Muhammad preaching in a Roman bathhouse near to the Kaaba. These hadiths were also deemed weak and impossible since there was no Roman bathhouse in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. That's why. Back in 2014, when I was looking at the Kaaba in Petra, I was surprised to see the archaeologists had uncovered a Roman bathhouse only 135 meters east of the Petra Kaaba. I could only shake my head in despair as I remembered those hadiths were rejected and lost because they did not fit into the hadith collections or what the collectors of hadiths thought was acceptable. So what is my approach to hadiths? I deal with them as history, not as theology. In most of them, there is some grain of historical truth that will help us understand the place and the time when Muhammad lived. However, looking at hadith as the basis of theology is a problem that Muslims face and have to decide about. But for outsiders like myself, 
whose main interest is not in theology, the Hadiths contain valuable information and clues about what was taking place historically during the lifetime of Muhammad and in the centuries that follow. Now, many of you have discovered by now that I prefer the histories rather than the Hadiths. So I use Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, and Al-Tabri. While these historians had some interest in Hadith, they were more interested in putting together a historical account of the life and times of the Prophet in chronological order. Their writings tell us a lot about the people and how they viewed the history of their time uh, and so forth. And it's clear that they appreciated that there were discrepancies in the historical accounts. That's the way history is. History always comes to us through the eyes of people who write down what's happening in their lifetime or in the uh, period previous to them. Some historians also rec uh, record what people thought long ago. But people don't get all worked up about differentiating between them because they are viewed as history, not Hadith. Let's go back to Noah's Ark circulating the Kaaba. There are several Hadiths about this. Why are they there? They are obviously not true or virtually impossible to determine, but they did come from, did they come from divine revelation? How did Ibn Abbas know this? We have no record of where he got his information from. So why were they included? And does it even matter? Does it make history seem weaker, Islamic history? That may be our Western mind, but it seems to me that the things were remembered from sermons that Ibn Abbas preached. In the case of Noah's Ark, people remembered when Ibn Abbas gave this account as an illustration of how important the Kaaba was all down through history. The story seemed significant, and so it was repeated, and eventually... It found its way to the Hadith collectors, and they had to decide and consider. Last week, I received a letter in the mail from a lady who remembered that I came to their town 28 years ago, and uh, I was uh, to speak in their church, and I felt God wanted me to speak on the topic of the body of Christ. And now, 28 years later, she found my address, and she wrote to me about that day, that message, and how it impacted her life. She remembered that sermon 28 years later. I think the Hadiths about the Kaaba and Noah's Ark are like that. People who were there were struck by something, and they remembered it. And years later, they told it to others, and they told it to others, and it eventually found its way into the Hadiths. And then... It was removed by the Hadith collectors who didn't like this story about Noah's Ark for some reason or other. But why was it removed? Because of history or because of religion? Could Ibn Abbas actually have told this story as a sermon illustration? Did Ibn Abbas only speak the truth 100% of the time? Uh, he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't even a caliph. So why are his words considered for Hadith material? Because he was a companion of the Prophet? You see, it doesn't bother me that he may have said this, because I do not think he was uh, laying down theological foundations, and I don't count on that for my theology. I think he was emphasizing a point about how central the Kaaba was. This is the problem with Hadith. The writers and the listeners of Hadith want theological foundation. Historians want to record events as remembered by others. That's why I am approaching the Hadith as a historian, not a theologian. My interest is not in the question, does the Hadith provide accurate theological information? To me, it's just, uh, did Ibn Abbas once preach a sermon in which he used the illustration of Noah's Ark going around the Kaaba in his sermon? And uh, so it, it doesn't make uh, something legitimate or illegitimate. I'm not judging it on that basis. But the fact that so many people recorded a similar story tells me it was a common illustration used by other preachers in the first centuries of Islam. As a historian, I don't think it should be thrown away if it was commonly used at the time. 
The same thing goes for Christianity and the early church fathers, even the Gnostics. I do think the Gnostics and their writings were wrong. Even deliberate falsifications of the truth. I think they invented things. I don't think anyone should use Gnostic writings for theology or the basis of their, their uh, understanding of what Christianity was back then. Not at all. But they provide an important background to what was taking place at the time. We shouldn't throw them away because it helps us understand other things that were said and done at the time. So when we come to the Hadiths, they have great value to a historian who is trying to unravel what was happening at the time. We accept that there are a uh, multitude of conflicting Hadiths because there were a multitude of conflicting groups within Islam at the time. Just read the histories for the first two centuries of Islam. It's filled with turmoil and infighting. Unfortunately, today some people have a picture in their minds of some sort of solidarity and union of Islam in the early days. If so, I don't think they have ever read Islamic history. So if I know from the histories about the turmoil and the trouble that existed at the time, should I not expect the Hadiths to reflect that same turmoil and trouble? I urge you to stop reading Hadith as theology and start reading Hadith as history. Then they will give you a very interesting glimpse into the thoughts of people during the opening centuries of Islam. One example of hadith that have come to me is with eating of lizards. A lady once served meat that had lizard meat in it. When the prophet was informed, he allowed the people to eat it, even though he personally chose not to eat lizard meat. Back in 1980, I was out in the desert with a group of students, and we came across a large lizard, which they called Abu Bres. And we discussed that very hadith. Was it lawful to kill and eat Abu Bres? As long as there was a hadith that allowed them to do so, they felt the freedom in themselves to eat uh, lizard meat. From then, it was a religious interpretation. But um, the hadith in Abu Dawood tells us that it is haram to eat lizard. So what do you do? There are conflicting hadiths. Now, I study hadith not to find out what's halal or what's haram, but to understand history, and I accept that people disagree with one another. For a modern example, take COVID-19. Today, there are various and conflicting voices and opinions. Political leaders are generally want us to accept one view, but in truth, there are many views. One does not have to sit long in a local coffee shop to hear lots of different views and conflicting views about the virus. As a historian, I want those conflicting views to be preserved in history. Not just the official government stance. If that is all we know, we will not understand much of what was happening at the time. So as a historian, I pay attention to the anomalies because I want to understand history and uncover what people were thinking and wrestling with long ago. That is why I read Hadiths. Not for religious or theological significance, but to understand the mindset of people back at that time. And so in my videos, I will continue to refer to Hadiths because they illustrate to me what some people were thinking back then. And just as they were different and they had conflicting views back then, uh, there are conflicting views in the literature that was produced. Let me give you one example in, close, in closing of why uh, preserving history is important. Al-Tabari addresses an important issue. When Abraham took his son up to the mountain to sacrifice him, and then God provided a replacement, which son did he take? Al-Tabari writes about this in volume 2, starting on page 85, that's in the English version, and he provides us with two pages of hadiths, with their isnad, that insist that Muhammad said that it was Isaac that Abraham took up to sacrifice. Isaac, not Ishmael. Look it up, Al-Tabri. Volume 2. But then, 
we come to a section at the bottom of page 86, and it goes on to the bottom of page 90 with hadiths and their isnad that say it was Ishmael that they was offered. Al-Tabri deliberately presents us with six pages of conflicting hadiths, some of them with the same isnad. Why does Al-Tabri do this? Because Al-Tabri is recording history, not theology. He's telling us that in his day, this topic was dividing people. And so, like a good historian, he is providing us with both sides of the argument. He's not trying to persuade you with one side or the other. That is for the reader to decide. And so I think that some Hadith co uh, collectors felt free to collect conflicting Hadiths because in their day, both sides were held as correct by one group or the other. Topics of religion are topics of faith. You make your own decision and you bear the consequences of your own decision. Topics of history are all about digging out facts. And Al-Tabri is telling us that they couldn't decide in his day. So conflicting hadiths tell me that there were conf uh, conflicts about topics back then. Remember, the hadith collectors were from 200 to 300 years removed from the fact, but already many of these topics could not be decided on the basis of hadith alone. So I think hadith are useful in telling us things. We can get some solid information from conflicting hadiths if we view them as history, not theology. I'm Dan Gibson. This has been uh, another video in the question and answer series. This has been my view on hadiths.